The calm sea is an illusion. There is always the unexpected lurking just below the surface. And when chaos erupts, some can swim to the shore, while others will sink into the abyss. Your host, Chris Kane, is an insurance adjuster and also an agent licensed in multiple states. He spent over 30 years helping people with claims, and this podcast is to help business owners, supervisors, and employees to be prepared before and after a work comp injury occurs. Batten down the hatches and join us as we navigate the sea of confusion. Hi, I'm Chris Kane, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to discuss drug-free workplaces. A lot of people think that drug-free workplace is just a way for an employer to get out of paying a worker's compensation claim. And to some extent, that's a true statement, especially in states that recognize a drug-free workplace program. In most of these states, it basically switches the burden of proof from the employer to the employee to show that it was a direct result from being intoxicated or under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Usually when employers embrace it in this context, the programs never really take off. The best programs are better addressed for what drug-free workplace was intended to be, and that is for safety. We've long held that truck drivers, especially and anybody that's under the DOT regulations for the federal government, are required to undergo testing, both for drugs and alcohol. Federal DOT regulations require that individuals that fall under their governance undergo drug and alcohol testing. These tests are specific. They specifically target five specific drugs and, of course, alcohol. The reason for this is, obviously, you've got 80,000 pounds running down the highway with somebody that you don't really don't want under the influence of drugs and alcohol. I always say this is 80,000 pounds of death, and unfortunately, many people are killed every year. In, on the interstates and on local highways and roadways from DOT individuals that are not obeying the laws with this regard. In regards to workers' cop, though, DOT individuals in a drug-free workplace are automatically excluded. Why? Because they're already doing more than what most drug-free workplaces require, and there's no need to subset an employee to doing the same test twice for two different programs. In most drug-free workplaces, there are several steps that need to take place. The first is the actual drug test. The drug test needs to cover at least the five specific DOT drugs, and it can be expanded to other drugs as well. Uh, The tests themselves need to be done pre-employment, post-accident, if you're not a zero-tolerance employer, a return-to-duty test, random test, and reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion being, just as it says, if an employer sees an employee that is obviously not acting normal, to go ahead and have them tested as well. There are a lot of benefits to being a drug-free workplace, from discounts to the insurance to also, you know, having a, a safer workplace. But the realities when a claim occur can be devastating. For example, we've had many cases and claims I've handled personally where the employee got up, had a headache or sinus problems, went to the medicine cabinet and took a pill that was basically a prescription for their wife or child, have an accident. Well, that's an illegal use of prescriptions. The prescription is only mandated for the person that is prescribed. So it's hard to tell somebody that they're not going to have workers' comp benefits just because they took somebody else's prescription. The other devastating effect of a drug-free workplace is when we've had deaths. One particular, we had a death involving some workers installing a silo 
they had all went back to their hotel rooms since they were working out of town and decided to try marijuana. Next day, the employee was on the silo, walked outside of the area without any fall protection, slipped on some wet metal and landed wrong and died. It puts everybody in a very sad position to have to deny a death claim, especially for somebody that was under the influence of drugs. So there is some harsh realities to it. It's not always just to get out of a small workers' comp claim. It's also safety for your other employees. Many times, especially in manufacturing and warehouses and you know, in close proximity where employees are working together with either mobile equipment like forklifts or with machines themselves, a lot of times the person that gets injured is not the one that actually causes the accident. And this is one of the things a lot of people don't understand in the drug-free workplace program. You have to show that the influence of the drug is what actually resulted in the injury. If I'm standing at my workstation, high as a kite, got my pills in my pocket, just pop some narcotics, doing well to function at my station, and then somebody comes along with a forklift and backs into me and hurts me. Well, just because I'm positive doesn't mean that you could deny the work cop claim. Basically, if I'd been stone cold sober, it wouldn't affect what would have happened. So you have to look at these programs in a holistic view. The second thing on drug-free workplace programs is education. And just like the scenarios I've laid out before, all the employees need to be placed on notice that you're going to a drug-free workplace. And they all need to have at least an hour or two of the employers telling everybody, having discussion of what's going to go on. Supervisors need to be trained additionally to recognize reasonable suspicion, what to do after an accident, where to send employees for drug screens, etc. The next item is usually each state has their own certification form. In these certification forms, they will want to know which facilities you're using for testing, whether or not you're doing random drug testing, which is usually not required under most drug-free workplaces. But if you are, they want to know the statistics on that. Make sure that you are using a true random system. Just randomly picking the same person over and over is not a random system, by the way. The other is to sit there and have all of the data together on how many positives, how many negatives, how many tests you've done a month. And then they'll want to know which testing facility you're using, what type of test, and who the doctor is for the MRO. The MRO is the medical review officer. If a test is positive, you just don't run out and say it's positive and that's the end of it and you need the protection of having a doctor review the test results. There are many times that there are false positives for a number of reasons, but the most common is if they're using a prescription medication, especially if if it's their own medication, the doctor will call the employee, ask them if they're taking any medications, and if they are, he gets the prescription number, and the doctor's name that prescribed and verifies this prescription. Most states now have what Kentucky developed known as a CASPER system, which is basically allows to check to see what prescriptions have been issued to an individual. They're able to verify this, and then the results will come back as either a positive or a negative. The reason why is usually kept confidential, But this explains why sometimes you have a positive drug screen, but after the MRO review, it comes back as a negative. The last thing is the implementation. A lot of people start out with this pretty strong and heavy, and then they sort of fade off. 
This needs to be a yearly process, just like your insurance policy is. Every year, you need to review the program, how effective it's been, and what results are you seeing. What can you do to quantify this? And has it shown any reductions in accidents? A lot of times, claims are avoided just for the mere fact that if it's a small paper cut or you know, the small bruise, a lot of employees won't turn in a claim just because they just want to go through the hassle of taking the drug test. Admittedly, nobody really likes to go and urinate in a bottle. I mean, it's not the most fun thing in the world. Plus, it's a hassle and it takes away from your day. Especially if there's nothing really hurt or you feel like you don't need medical attention. So, in that regards, it is a deterrent. It's not what you really want to look for, that you would like to know where people are getting injured just so you can show or make adjustments to avoid a bigger injury in the future. But the reality of it is, is the social reaction. Nobody, again, really wants to go for a drug test, no matter who they are. All right, Lauren here, and I have some questions. So does anyone have to stay with them while they're taking the test? If you've had a worker's cop claim, the supervisor needs to stay with them. They need to take them to the doctor if they're they're ambulatory. If they require an ambulance or something stronger like that, you probably still need to follow the ambulance and be at the hospital with them. Uh, it's always a good idea. Now, as far as being with them and taking the test, I, I highly discourage this. I think the tests are better off, especially if it's a urine test, to go to a collection facility. Uh, usually, most walk-in clinics will perform this service. Uh, it's cleaner, more sanitary. Uh, it makes better sense for the for everyone involved. But as far as staying with them, yeah, they should take them to the to these clinics and stay with them. Because the last thing you want to do is put somebody in a car that you knew that you had suspected them to be under the influence of drugs. So it's really counterintuitive not to be with them. Are you saying that if you have 50 people in the office, he has to go 50 times to have everyone pre-tested? No, on pre on pretest, it's usually just for new hires. When you set up a drug free workplace, you would only do the new employees. Now, if the employer wanted to test everybody; they they could do that, but it's really not cost effective, and you would have to give them notice in some states that you were doing that. I think the better course is to make an announcement that. You know, let's just say in October you decide you're going to do a drug-free workplace and let everybody know that on January 1, you will start doing testing, but as the people that are already hired will be grandfathered in. All new hires after that point will be tested in the pre-test process. This is the more efficient. It's actually the, the better approach. You could get into a lot of legal ramifications by just going and testing everybody but at the same time it's not to say it hadn't been done and a lot of employers have done that in the past so the new hires you go by themselves to the clinic yeah the new hires you would send to a clinic you would give them the chain of custody form which would have all the information that they would need it's usually a carbonless you know six part four part form that they would take with them to the doctor. They would get a copy of, they would have a copy to go back to the employer, and then, of course, the original would stay with the test. And for the business owner, does he just set this program up on his own and get started, or does he have to let the insurance carrier know that he's starting this? No, you can set up drug-free workplace programs on your own. Uh, the states usually offer help and assistance in this regard, especially if they're states that provide drug-free workplaces. Now, each state has different rules and different levels of involvement and excitement about it. Some states actually provide discounts on the insurance, so obviously if you do get it set up, you want to let your insurance carrier or agent know. 
uh, a lot of times when we're writing policies, we we go out and encourage them to be a drug-free workplace. And if they are a drug-free workplace, we want to get their certificate from the state certifying that they're a drug-free workplace for the discounts with the insurance company. Do you have any pet peeves, the things that you see people do wrong all the time in this? A lot of pet peeves is somebody says they're they're injured, but they don't want to go to the hospital right then. They want to wait. I've usually, in next cases, I tell the employers to go ahead and tell them if they're going to turn in a work cop claim, they need to go ahead and be tested and be seen. Uh, usually when that, that occurs, there's usually a reason why. It's most people that are legitimately hurt want to go see a doctor regardless. It's just one of these things you have to deal with the situation. There's a million different scenarios out there but you got to have your bases in play so you can adapt to those situations. And if you're going by the certifications from the state and by your insurance company, why well, you're, you're going to be protected in that regard because you're certified and you're doing everything you're supposed to. But, you know, again, it's, nothing's 100% foolproof. There's always that that one case that can go south on you for a number of reasons. So it's always good to have your basis in play. And and basically the good rule of thumb is to treat everybody the same. Once you start treating one person different than another, that's when you run into problems. You know, you didn't make so-and-so have a test when they went to the doctor, but you're making me have a test and now you want to deny my comp claim. That's where you run into problems when you do favoritism or again, just not treating everybody the same. Well, thank you everybody for listening today. I know this is quite a bit of information all crammed into a short podcast. If you have questions, obviously go to your agent and insurance carrier. They'll be glad to provide information. If not, we're always available as well. That work comp chaos. Again, thank you to Lauren and Tyler and for all their hard work and making this podcast a reality. I'll drop anchor here and let's see you again soon. Thank you for your support of this podcast. For additional information, please visit our website, workcompchaos.com. All links available in the description below. Until next time, fair winds and following seas.